Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. As a real estate investor, your mission is to compile an awesome portfolio of property. Today, we're going to share a way to make more money and pay less in tax. That's completely legal. It's one of the best tax tools for real estate investors. And we've got a great guest on the Real Estate Guys radio program. All aboard. It's last call for the Real Estate Guys 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. This one-of-a-kind event is nearly sold out, so grab your spot now. Joining us this year is the rebel capitalist George Gammon, sales legend best-selling author Tom Hopkins, CPA Tom Wheelwright, and Canon Daniil McElroy. Plus, Anton Matley, Mauricio Raul, Beth Clifford, Brad Sumrock, and joining us for his 11th Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. It all begins June 13th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Visit investorsummitatsea.com to get all the details and reserve your spot now. And we still have room for a few young adults, ages 18 to 25 at a very special rate. Go to investorsummitatsea.com and make plans to spend time with the real estate guys, Ken McElroy, Peter Schiff, and an all-star faculty on the 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, getting ready for summer around the Real Estate Guys studios. Lots going on. We've got some great interviews coming up today. We're going to talk about one of the best tools there is for real estate investors to both make more money and pay less tax. Now, ironically, this is something that we haven't talked about in many, many years. It's an important provision of the Internal Revenue Code. Now, before you tune away and think, oh no, we're going to talk taxes again, this is maybe the most exciting part about taxes when it comes to real estate. If you didn't know about this tool, then every time you sold a property, you'd pay tax, sometimes a lot of tax. Then you wouldn't have that much left over to buy another property with. And many investors do that. They keep getting slammed on tax in every transaction and therefore can't buy as much property going forward. But this tool, the 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange, allows you to sell a property and buy another property legally paying no tax. Now, technically, it's deferring the tax. You're not avoiding the tax. You're deferring. And we're going to learn all about that today. But the mindset of this is it really lets you leverage your increasing real estate holdings. Our friend, the certified public accountant, Tom Wheelwright, explains that most of the tax code are incentives, deductions, ways that you can save tax. Only a very small part of the code has to do with paying tax, how much tax is owed. The vast majority are the various incentives the government gives us to invest in real estate. Now, the real estate guys have listeners in more than 190 countries. The 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange is a United States tax code, but there are similar provisions in other places. So rather than get caught up on the fact that this is U.S. tax law, I want you to really think about what this accomplishes. If I've got a portion of my income that I'm going to put into real estate, this tool will allow me to continue to leverage that into the future and create a much bigger portfolio. That's the good news. The bad news, if there is any, is that because this is a government-based incentive, there are rules, regulations, metrics that you have to follow. It's not that complicated. In fact, we'll get through the majority of it today. But the time to be thinking about this is early in your investing career. It's never too late. If you've bought and sold real estate and paid taxes for years, you could discover this tool and moving forward, save a ton and make more money. But if you're a newer investor, especially the time to get your mind around the 1031 tax deferred exchange is now. And to do that, we've got an awesome guest. I'm delighted to have Scott Saunders on our program. I've had a chance to spend time with Scott on several occasions He's an engaging guy. He loves real estate. He's an active investor. But what he does for a living is help people complete 1031 tax deferred exchanges so that they can make more money and pay less tax. When we come back, Scott Saunders on the Real Estate Guys radio program. 
Hey everybody, it's Ken McElroy and I'm on with the Real Estate Guys and I'm very excited to be a guest and a speaker at the Investor Summit coming up. If you haven't signed up, be sure to do so. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Now in our 28th year of broadcast, we love making money with real estate and you can make more money if you pay less tax. Today, we're gonna to talk about one of the coolest tools there is when it comes to saving tax money and that is the 1031 tax deferred exchange it's a section of the internal revenue code that allows real estate investors to save some money and here to talk about it a guy that has done thousands and thousands of these transactions been doing it for more than 35 years welcome to the real estate guys radio program our friend scott saunders hey scott hey robert great to be with you today excited to talk about this topic and share with your listeners a powerful strategy that can really make a difference as people grow and scale a portfolio. So excited to dig into it, get into the mechanics, all the different applications. Um, hopefully it's gonna be a lot of fun. People think of taxes and they go, ooh, well, we're talking about how to defer paying taxes, keep more of your hard-earned money, Hopefully that's a, a great value add for everybody. Well, it is because when you start out, you want to preserve as much going forward as possible. And uh, as I talked about at the start of the show, most of the internal revenue code is not how we get taxed. It's the ways that we have incentive to not get taxed. And this is a big one. So take us through what the premise is behind allowing this, because it's a very favorable tax treatment, as we'll learn. But uh, the government doesn't do anything by accident. So take take us through the genesis of the 1031 tax deferred exchange. Happy to do that. Believe it or not, Robert, 1031 became a part of the tax code way back in 1921, so a long time ago. And really the foundation, kind of the reason why, is the government said, why should we penalize somebody when they're just going to redeploy their capital into another property? And really, if we go back, and I'll, I'll take everybody back on a little history lesson, look at what America was like in the 20s. We had a lot of agriculture, small business owners, rural farms, so, Robert, let's just say you had a wheat farm, for lack of a better example. I had a corn farm, and we knew each other in town, and you wanted to switch over to doing farming corn. I wanted to do wheat. Well, let's just say we bought those properties 20 years ago, so they had gone up a little bit in value. At the end of the day, if you look at the way society was back in the 20s, what did we do as farmers? We put everything back into our farm, right? We bought new seed. We got horses, equipment. And so the government, you know, if they were going to come into our, somebody in rural America and actually tax them on the gain, they're going to now deprive you and I both of capital that we need to operate our farm and our business. Right. So the concept was, wait a minute, if you're going to go from a wheat farm to a corn farm, you haven't actually liquidated and put cash in your pocket. You've just gone from one property that you're farming into another with a different type of crop. So the initial justification rationale was continuity of investment. You haven't actually cashed out. You've just redeployed the capital into another farm. Now, it's farm. It can be for businesses, health for investment. And then today, for the viewers on your show, any type of investment property. So it really allows you to just redeploy and reinvest and the benefit for the economy, you know, you say the government's not stupid. Um, you know, Tom Wheelwright's got some great books talking about the government's perspective, right? Why do they allow some of these mechanisms in the code? People that do exchanges actually end up improving their properties. They enhance them, right? So they'll go into a property and they might fix it up. They might renovate the property. So now they're enhancing the supply of real estate. So at the end of the day, there are two benefits. The U.S. government gets more capital reinvested into real estate, both residential, commercial, and everything in between. The individual investor gets a huge benefit because instead of paying taxes in a sale, they're able to defer those taxes into the future. And we'll talk about some little bit more advanced strategies there that I'm sure you're aware of. You can defer that, and then you take all of your purchasing power, your gross equity, because you haven't paid taxes. Now you get to redeploy that into other property or, Robert, into property. So a lot of people might sell one property, and they maybe will exchange for two replacement properties. So now they've got more real estate appreciating, a little more tax benefits, a little more cash flow coming in. 
And somebody that does this over a long period of time is really going to see their portfolio grow and scale much faster than somebody who just sells and pays taxes every time. So that's really, it's it's a huge gift to real estate investors and people that own property that they use in their business. It's really a significant advantage. And, and frankly, that's why it's been in the tax code for so long. It's been there through boom times, recessions, you know, and it's been through all sorts of different political administrations because it helps create jobs, it helps the economy, and it helps grow the GDP of the country. Now, let's get into the whole concept of what this kind of an exchange is. Originally, it truly was an exchange. So to your example, the wheat and corn farmer, we would exchange the land and it would happen at the same time. doesn't work like that today. We don't have to get into the details of the Starker exchange and all of that. But just understand there's a few rules that are non-negotiable. So Scott's going to teach you what those rules are. And to do a 1031, you have to abide by the rules or you lose that tax preservation. But the concept is this, rather than sell my investment house, pay taxes on the gain and use what's left to buy another property, the 1031 allows me to put all of that gain into another property and not avoid, but defer the tax. In order to do that, there's some rules. And the first is you need to work with a third party that is set up to do this because you cannot have constructive receipt of the money. So talk uh, to that part of it, how a company gets set up to be that third party. Sure. So as you mentioned, the exchange started with simultaneous swaps, but now most of the exchanges are where you would pretty much just list a property, get it under contract, prior to closing. This is a really important thing. You need to hire and engage what is called a qualified intermediary. Now that's kind of a mouthful. And I'll tell you and your listeners, there are other synonymous terms for that. A lot of people today refer to it by abbreviation, a QI. Yep. Some refer to them as an intermediary. Um, if you're on the West Coast, Southern California, you might hear them called an accommodator. You might also hear it called a facilitator. So all of those terms describe this middle entity. This is a fourth party principle that steps into the transaction. So I'll try and use the IRS language, a qualified intermediary. Here's what they do. When you would enter into a contract to sell an investment property, Robert, you get it under contract, you open it up with a closing officer, title company, and then that contract, then you contact a qualified intermediary. That qualified intermediary is gonna prepare some legal documents, but one of them is what's called an assignment of the contract. So your right to sell the property is assigned to the qualified intermediary. They step into your shoes and now become the seller of the property. So when you go to close it, everything from your end happens just like it would in a normal closing, right? You're gonna close on time. It's not gonna hold everything up, but when it closes, the title would go from you to the buyer, but the qualified intermediary now has been inserted as the seller. So they sell the property to the buyer and the money comes to them. And as you mentioned, this is important. You can't actually receive the funds and you can't legally be entitled. So some people want to set up an exchange, but they don't do it before they close. And they find out after the fact that doesn't work. So then the qualified intermediary receives the money. And that's the very beginning of the exchange is when that property closes, we're going to call that on the time deadline, day zero. And, and by the way, there are hundreds of entities out there that act as a qualified intermediary um, all over the country. There are independent companies set up that way. Some law firms work that way. And so they're all over. Uh, a great resource I'll share with your listeners. There's a group and it's a mouthful called the Federation of Exchange Accommodators. They are the National Trade Association. Their website's super easy to remember. It's 1031.org. So what I think of as reputable qualified intermediaries will belong to that, and they subscribe to a code of ethics regarding how they'll hold the funds and how they will treat the customer. So that's kind of how you, you, know, you can locate them. You could certainly ask your closing officer at the title company, a lot of real estate professionals might know. And some people you might want to ask your tax advisor, maybe your real estate attorney. I'd recommend getting, you know, a few referrals and 
making a few phone calls and just doing some due diligence. But that's how you find a company called a qualified intermediary. So the intermediary steps in, and this is an important part. This is what keeps the exchange true, if you will. You don't take the money, you're not on the title, and it's all perfectly legal, been doing this for a long, long time, and it's in the code. So you just have to get your mind around it. Now what happens is you want to buy another property, right? You're going to relinquish that first property that you sold. You have a buyer. You've got a close date. The intermediary has stepped in to fulfill those functions. Now you're going to buy a replacement property. There are some important rules and some timelines. Take us through that, Scott. Yeah. Here's what the timeline is. So this is what's called a delayed exchange. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a deferred, but most exchanges, Robert, are a variation of a delayed exchange. This is by far the most common one. The day you close is day zero. Now you've got 45 calendar days and it ends at midnight of the 45th day. We call that the identification period. So the first 45 days, you can identify property that you want to purchase. And I'll, I'll kind of go through what those rules are. Then on day 45, midnight of day 45, the identification period is over. So you have to buy something that you've identified in the first 45 days. Now we all know in a transaction, you've got to get a loan, qualify, do due diligence, you know, inspections, things of that nature. You have another 135 days for a maximum of 180 days to close. So six months, 180 days maximum, first 45 to identify, another 135 days to close. And just a little caveat, it's 180 days or the date your tax return is due, whichever is earlier. So any of your listeners closing around middle of October, if they file their taxes on April 15th, what they want to do is file an extension, complete the exchange in 180 days, and then file their tax return. So just a little detail. You know, sometimes the tax code has got some little fine print and people think, oh, I have 180. And that's true most of the time. But you got to be aware that, you know, people falling in that category, it's 180 days or the date the tax return is due, whichever is earlier. Well, and when we talk about the calendar, both the 45 days and the 180 calendar days, that is firm. No holidays, no weekends, none of that. It has to be within those time frames or the exchange fails. Correct. Yeah. And that's why I said calendar days. They're good. If, you're, if your 45th day falls on Christmas, you want to identify it before then, right? It's yeah. same thing on your closing. If it falls on a holiday, you need to close before that. So, and there, there's just sequential calendar days that you have to identify it. There is one narrow caveat. It doesn't come up a lot, but if you happen to have property in what's called a presidentially declared disaster area. So think of the Maui wildfires or yeah. a major hurricane. If you have a major event that gets elevated to that level, it may become eligible for an extension, but you have to have property in that county or tax returns in that county. So 99.9% .9 of the time, they're set in stone. But I just want to pass on the the IRS, believe it or not, you know, we, we all kind of, uh, you know, look at the IRS as being the heavy hand. They've actually been extending a lot of these for presidentially declared disaster areas. I've seen them for tornadoes and windstorms and all sorts of things. So they seem to be coming a, a touch more liberal if there's a major disaster. You know, typically it's a natural disaster of granting that, but it's just narrow in your little area. So keep that in mind. Well, let's talk about the uh, identification part, because that's the part that's new to people. Yeah, you understand closing and closing property and it has to fit in the 180 days. But the identification part is uh, critical and it's not as simple as it sounds because there's some different ways you can do it. Yeah, there are. So in fact, I'll start with how do you identify and then we'll discuss the rules. A lot of people think you have to be under contract to buy a property. And that's not true. You don't. What you need to do essentially is you need to identify a specific property. And the term is it has to be unambiguously described. Let's think of a street address, right? 238 Main Street, condo 76 in this complex. So think of a specific property. So you don't need to be under contract Practically speaking, it would be wise to be negotiating, doing your due diligence. So it's got to be identified unambiguous. You've got to identify it before midnight of the 45th day with the qualified intermediary in a written document 
that is signed and dated by the real estate investor. So that's how you identify. Yep. Now we've got three different rules that you've got to abide by. And you've got to fit into one of these three categories. And really two of the three are what are commonly used. The first one's called the three property rule. I can identify three properties of any value but I'm limited to three. So if I sell for 400,000, I identify one at 400, one at 600 and one at a million, but I'm limited to three. And that's a pretty common rule. The other rule is when somebody wants to maybe go out of a, a market where they've got a high value and maybe they want to go to a part of the country where values are lower. So I sell in Los Angeles, California for 2 million and I want to buy smaller properties in Des Moines. Right. So you might want need a whole bunch more than just three. So that one's called the 200 percent rule. I can identify as many as I want, but no more than twice what I sold. So if I sell for a million, I can't identify as many, but they can't go over two million. So to summarize the two rules, three property rule, you're limited on three assets of any value. The flip side is now I'm capped off at twice the value of what I sold, the gross sales price but I can identify an unlimited number. So you generally want to fit into one of those two. Real quickly, there's a third one that says you identify more than three and more than 200% of what you sold. Then you've got to close on 95% of what you've identified. Yeah. It's technically in the code. Very, very hard to do that. So think of focusing on, on, the, on the first two. And just to let the listeners know, too, a good qualified intermediary for everybody is going to walk you through this whole process. When you close a transaction, they will typically the same day send out a notice to you, letting you know day zero, 45, and 180. They'll let you know the proceeds they're holding, what account it was deposited into, They'll provide a summary of these rules and a form to identify on. So think of a qualified intermediary as, as kind of lubricating the whole process, realizing most investors do this infrequently. A qualified intermediary's job is to kind of walk everybody through the steps involved and try and make it really user friendly. And the great news is you get all that expertise and help and it's uh, super inexpensive. So people think, oh, this sounds like a really, ex it just cut to the chase. It's not very expensive at all. Under $2,000 for most transactions. And that's all it costs. It's a, it's a great value because again, since this is a tax issue, you want to make sure everything is done correctly because if you don't do it right, and you get audited, uh, the, the penalties could be severe. So, and, and not only that, it's not just that we don't want to pay tax. It's that we want the use of as many of those proceeds as we can moving forward, which kind of takes us to the next part of this. And that is, if I'm going to exchange, you know, the three property rule, if I, if I sell a $100,000 rental property, I buy a $150,000 rental property. Okay. Well, I identified three different properties because I wasn't sure which one I was going to, you know, close on, but I only have to close on one. Now, what if I sold a $100,000 property? I wanted to buy two $50,000 properties. Okay, well, that three property rule might still work and I could identify a third property, but you can start to see that if I take that million dollar house in Los Angeles, which is a you know two one fixer upper, and I, uh, I exchange into Des Moines, I'm gonna get a lot more properties. So that kind of dictates which rule you use. But the other part of the, the rules, if you will, are how much you can buy and what happens when you have a loan. Can you speak to those? Yeah. So this is really important in exchange. And I, you, I want to circle back to one thing you mentioned, which was doing this properly. I highly recommend to everybody, always consult with a good qualified intermediary. And secondly, talk to your tax advisor. They know your tax situation. They know how you hold title. They know everything going on. It's really important because this is a tax strategy. You want to get your tax advisor and it could be just a quick phone call, checking in, saying this is what I want to do, making sure that they're overseeing it. So real critical to do that. The rules for full tax deferral and, and a lot of people do partially deferred exchanges and I'll, I'll address that. If you want to have a 100% tax deferred exchange, pay zero, which is what a lot of people strive for, you need to do two simple things. Number one, you need to reinvest all of your net equity. So when I say net equity, it just means your gross sales price. You'll subtract out the real estate commission. 
paying the title company, the fee, recording, preparing the settlement statement, and it would be the net proceeds due seller. That's what I call the net equity. So number one, that needs to be reinvested. Number two, and this is the one a lot of people aren't aware of, you need to have the same or a greater amount of debt. So if I'm half a mortgage of $83,000 on my sale, I want to have at least $83,000 of mortgage on my purchase. And I can combine that. I could buy two properties, one with 40,000 mortgage, one with 43. To summarize, reinvest net equity, same or a greater amount of debt or mortgage. And the terms that you'll hear kicked around, and I bet you a lot of people have heard this, if you take cash out, which you're permitted to do, it's called cash boot, and you pay taxes on that. If your mortgage goes down, so let's say I have a $200,000 mortgage, I buy a property with $180,000, and I don't add cash to offset it, I have $20,000 of what we call mortgage boot. And so you add the cash boot plus the mortgage boot to get the total boot. That's what you'll end up paying your taxes on is the total boot. So people do that. What if you know? What if you have an investment and you want to take a trip to Europe this summer? Maybe you do an exchange and you reinvest almost everything except ten thousand. You pay taxes on that. You still get most of the benefits of an exchange. But this is what you want to look at on your settlement statement. Look at your loan payoff. That's your mortgage. Look at your net equity. And if you want a hundred percent deferral. Those are the minimum. And then on the flip side, you can always add more. If you're going to go ahead and you want to leverage up, you can add more financing on your purchase. If you need to make a deal work and you want to throw in more cash because you need a little bit bigger down payment, you can do that. So you can always add cash. You can always add mortgage. And one other little piece, if you go down in mortgage, sometimes people, Robert, is they're getting near retirement, they want to deleverage a little bit. And they go, oh, I don't want to have to reinvest my debt, I'm trying to kind of lever down. You can do that. And so I could have less mortgage, but if I bring in outside cash to offset it, I can actually have a property with more equity in it and still end up with 100% deferral. So a lot of planning opportunities uh, for people. And just keep in mind, it's an aggregate, right? If I sell one and I buy three, I want to see how much of my net equity went in. And then I want to add up all my mortgages and make sure that they're more than what I came out of. So those are the basic rules. Now, Scott, we always say don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. And the reason what you just explained is important is perhaps you find those three fabulous properties that you want to exchange out of your current property into, and the numbers just don't quite work to get 100% deferral. Well, that's okay. 90% or 80% deferral is better than no deferral. So don't think that you have to get every single dollar forward. It's just if you do, that's how you take the most benefit of this. We're talking about the 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. We have Scott Saunders with us. When we come back, we'll talk more and give you some advanced strategies about exchanging. And we'll play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Looking to achieve passive income through real estate investing? Well, let me introduce you to Jim Shields and our friends over at Southern Impression Homes. Jim and the team have worked with hundreds of investors in our community over the last decade to help make their rental property goals a reality. They only build new construction in high growth, landlord friendly markets in Florida and offer cutting edge property management to help protect not only your assets, but your time. And to top it off, Southern Impression Homes offers in-house financing with mortgage rates as low as 4.75%. You can close in one of their new construction properties, either a single family, duplex, or quad in less than 30 days. Let Jim and the team help you achieve your goals of financial freedom like they've done for so many others. Check out their build to rent program by sending an email to sihomes at realestateguysradio.com. 1031 exchange buyers are welcome. That's sihomes at realestateguysradio.com. The Real Estate Guys are throwing a party and you're invited. 
Join us at the New Orleans Investment Conference, November 20th to 23rd. Now in its 50th year, it's the nation's longest-running investment conference and features some of the biggest names in economics and investing, including James Grant, George Gammon, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Rick Rule, Lynn Alden, and Doug Casey. Plus, I'll be speaking in multiple sessions, attending lots of others. And the Real Estate Guys are hosting our annual invitation-only party one of the evenings for our friends and listeners, including some VIPs for you to mingle with. So make plans today to join the Real Estate Guys at the 50th annual New Orleans Investment Conference. With all that's going on in the world, no serious investor can afford to miss it. Send an email to neworleans at realestateguysradio.com and we'll get you all the details. And I'll see you there. Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. We're so glad you're here. There are just two staterooms remaining on the 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. If you've been putting it off, the time has come. You've got to grab one of those cabins so you can spend time with Ken McElroy, George Gammon, Peter Schiff, Tom Wheelwright, Tommy Hopkins, Brian London, Dana Samuelson, Beth Clifford, Anton Matley, and more. Join us as we sail the high seas to Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. Get all the details at investorsummitatsea.com. That's investorsummitatsea.com. We're talking today about the 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange, an awesome tool to help real estate investors make more money and pay less in taxes. Before we get back to our interview with Scott Saunders, it's time to play real estate trivia. That's a chance for you to win a prize by knowing today's trivia question that has something to do with real estate. And believe it or not, the 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange today. Once you hear the question and think you know the answer, just send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address because the first person that gets it right is going to get an awesome book by one of my favorite authors, Stephen Pressfield. It's called The War of Art, kind of a play on the art of war. The War of Art by Steve Pressfield. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we had real estate rock star Ken McElroy on the program, and we asked this. Where was the largest straw bale maze ever built? Well, the answer is is in Rupert, Idaho. Known for its potatoes and other farms, a fall getaway in Idaho isn't complete without a straw maze. Well, in Rupert, Garden Sense created the mega maze and beat the world record of the biggest straw bale maze ever. They used 3,202 bales of straw and the maze measured 1.6 miles. That's amazing. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. The concept of the like-kind exchange can be traced back to the early 1900s, as Scott shared, but it wasn't until the Starker case in 1979 that the legality and specific rules of exchanges were solidified. The case involved T.J. Starker and his family who sought to defer the capital gains tax on the sale of some property. Here's what I want to know. What type of property did the Starkers sell? There's all kinds of property that could be used in exchanges, but this landmark case involved a particular type of property. What type of property was that? If you know or just want to guess, send your answer to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, your mailing address, and your guess. First person that gets it right gets this awesome book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're with Scott Saunders, who is with Asset Preservation Incorporated. What you guys do is this exact thing. You're a 1031 tax deferred exchange intermediary, which is how you've built up this great knowledge. Uh, when folks get to meet you in person over a beer, you can tell them a lot of awesome stories because there's crazy stuff that happens in the exchange world. But it's a pretty straightforward thing. And if you start early, you can continue to exchange. Now, I want to just make sure we circle back, Scott, on this whole idea that the intermediary steps into the position of the seller and then the buyer. So when you buy that replacement property and you're closing, your intermediary is involved there as well. Correct. So just like we did on the sale where the contract's assigned to the qualified intermediary, 
on the purchase, the same thing will happen. The contract will be assigned. So there's a simple assignment of contract from the investor over to the qualified intermediary. Now we step into the shoes, we become the purchaser. So the qualified intermediary takes the money we're holding on behalf of that investor. We purchase the new property and we have it directly deeded on over to the investor. And one thing I want to mention, I'm glad you brought that up. It's really important. State laws, as you know, vary from state to state and real estate forms and contracts are different. Um, some states have contracts that are non-assignable as they come out of the uh, MLS. Right. You want to make sure that you have an assignable contract. And the easy way to look at that is if you review the contract, if it doesn't prohibit assignability, if it doesn't say that this contract is not assignable, then by default it is. You know, I've got some language. In fact, uh, we'll talk at the end, some free resources I'll make available, but I'll share in one of those free resources, three sentences that you could put in your contract when you're selling or buying that put the language in and, you know, an attorney can say the same thing in probably two pages. These are kind of the basic three sentences. So I'll be sure to get back to you and your listeners with some suggested language. That way you're disclosing to the other party that your intents to do an exchange. Everybody's on the up and up. There are no surprises. And I'll include that so you can put that in your purchase and sale agreements. Awesome. And this is important that your agent understands you intend to do an exchange. Typically, uh, the listing agent will disclose to a prospective buyer's agent that the seller intends to do a 1031 tax for an exchange. You're always documenting that. Typically, it'll say something like at no cost to the buyer. So a buyer comes in and it doesn't matter to them whether you're selling and paying tax or doing an exchange, but they will need the cooperation, which really just amounts to the fact that they're now dealing with the the intermediary on the contract and not the original principal. And this works uh, whether or not you use an entity or in your own name. So those are things that that vary. Uh, Scott, let's talk about the idea that this isn't a one and done thing. If I do a 1031 exchange, my property's gone up in value. I've got some equity. I see a new opportunity. I move that forward. Uh, then a few years later, the same thing happens. You can continue to exchange and continue to defer the tax. Yeah, that is the real beauty of a 1031. It's it's not just a one-time transaction. So let's say you start out in your 20s and you buy a little piece of dirt, an acre. You exchange out of that into a single family, out of those into two single families, into four, into eight. Then you go out of that into a small apartment complex, and then out of that maybe into a commercial building as you're nearing retirement. So you've been doing multiple exchanges into different asset classes, right? Bare land, into single family residential, into commercial. The benefit of the code is it says as long as you exchange, you defer paying the capital gain taxes. And one of the big misconceptions out there, and unfortunately, even CPAs say that, well, you're going to have to pay your taxes sometime. You might as well just pay them at today's rates. And that is not true at all. We have people that exchange throughout their lifetime. And what you're able to do is build up a significant real estate portfolio, right? Significant numbers. You don't pay capital gain taxes throughout your lifetime. And with the current tax rules, you get what's called a step up in basis. And all that means in English is you get to pass it on to your heirs at the value that it's worth today. So you started a little piece of land for 80 grand. You've now built up a portfolio worth $10 million. You pass away and your children or heirs get it. It's worth 10 million. They don't pay any capital gain taxes at all either. So that's why it's a powerful tool. You can take advantage of your lifetime and you're able to pass on highly appreciated property to heirs. They can sell it the next day and pay zero in capital gains. Now, there might be other estate taxes, right? There are different thresholds that come in, but a good tax advisor can give you guidance. That's really the benefit. You know, I can tell you, I'm an investor, Robert. I do 1031s. I also own property. I will probably never sell. I will exchange throughout my entire lifetime and have property with tremendous amount of gain that I pass on to my children. And really, that's a way to kind of build some generational wealth. And I know a lot of real estate investors, when they get, you know, kind of nearing retirement, they start thinking of, how do I plan for the next generation? How do I pass on these skills? And how do I pass on these assets and the skill set to manage them? So, that's something that's really a big, big benefit of 1031. One point I just want to bring up, um, 
you talked about different entities. Any entity can do an exchange. So an individual can, a trust, a partnership, a C-Corp, an S-Corp. So the entity that relinquishes has to be the same entity that purchases or what we call the right. same tax owner. It does get a little tricky with partnerships. Um, you can't do an exchange on a partnership interest. So if you and I own property 50-50 in a partnership, the IRS says we can't do that. We've got some workarounds, some ways to do what's called a drop and swap or swap and drop. So if you have a partnership or LLC, consult with your tax advisor, consult with a knowledgeable qualified intermediary. You're going to need to do some planning in advance and get it out of that LLC or partnership. But just keep in mind, any entity up at that entity level can do a 1031 exchange. Well, that's a good point. And I think that brings up uh, another topic, which is as you're looking at this tool, which is a great, great, great tool, uh, there are things that it doesn't work for, like an interest in a syndication or, as you mentioned, a partnership, but it works for a ton. And there is this concept you'll hear about that you have to exchange like-kind property. But that's a wider category than you might imagine imagine. Can you speak to that? I certainly can. So let's start off and make it simple. It's got to be real property or what most people would call real estate. Personal property was allowed up until the end of 2017. And with the Tax Cuts and Job Act, that got eliminated. Uh, we used to do exchanges on farm equipment, corporate jets, art, collectibles, all sorts of fun stuff. Can't do it. Real estate, any type of real estate, if it's held for investment, can be exchanged for any other real estate held for investment. So it doesn't mean you've got to go land to land or single family to single family. So I can exchange land, single family, self-storage, multifamily, a ranch, a farm. I could also have maybe a, a business building that I use in my business. It's property held for investment or used in a business. I, I have a friend in town, had a car business and he owned the big shop retired and exchanged out of that into a ranch in Colorado that qualified for an exchange. So like kind's really broad and, and I'll just spend just a quick moment. I'll go off the rails a little bit, Robert, but it's broad. You can exchange water rights in certain states. You can do exchanges of certain oil, gas, and mineral interest. We literally exchange air in what's called a transferable development right in some jurisdictions. There are things called um, tenant in common or tick interests that can qualify. Yeah. There's something called a Delaware Statutory Trust or a DST, which is this hybrid. It's it's a, treated by the SEC as a security, but it qualifies. And so those are sold by registered financial advisors. They go to accredited investors. But that's another thing. Here's another niche. What about a vacation home held for investment? What if you build up a real estate portfolio and you want to get a vacation home for the family and grandkids, you can actually do that in a 1031 exchange. There are some specific rules that came out in 2008 that say exactly what has to happen. So a vacation home held for investment can actually be considered a like-kind property. So very, very broad. And we do, we do it on all sorts of agricultural type properties as well. So think of any real estate held for investment for any other type of real estate held for investment. But the, there are two types you can't exchange, Robert. Number one, you can't exchange property that you're holding for sale. So if you're a developer, that won't work. If you do a fix and flip and the intents to make that quick profit, that's excluded also. So you can't exchange property held for sale. The other category is you can't exchange for your primary residence. If you live in it, it's not held for investment. Or if you're going to live in a new property, that doesn't qualify. So it's got to have... Typically, unless it's bare land, it's got to have rental income of some sort, whether it's residential or commercial. Now, Scott has put together an awesome report called The 10 Reasons to Exchange and Why You Should Never Pay Capital Gain Taxes Again. That'll cover some of the things we talked about and a few more. So before we're done, we'll tell you how you get your hands on that. And he's going to throw in a bonus report, which is super cool, uh, called The Vacation Home Handbook. So if you uh, were intrigued by that conversation, wait a minute, my vacation home, don't I spend time there and how all that works? Uh, we won't cover it now, but uh, we'll include that uh, in case that applies to you. Uh, 
as a really cool resource. There is one other thing. We have listeners in 194 countries, and uh, the 1031 Exchange is a United States tool, but there are other exchange opportunities in other countries, so that would be a bigger topic. But as far as it concerns a U.S. citizen and an exchange, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't exchange a property in the United States for a property, say, in Mexico. Is that true? Correct. It's got to be a U.S. property for U.S. So any of the 50 states, in addition, Guam qualifies, the Mariana Islands qualify, the U.S. Virgin Islands qualify. However, and we get this a lot, Puerto Rico doesn't qualify. And so there's some anomalies in the code. I won't go into the weeds of that, but just trust me, anywhere in the United States for any other U.S. property, and you can't, Guam, Marion Islands, and U.S. Virgin Islands are also included. And then one more uh, little planning opportunity, you can do a foreign for foreign. I can exchange a condo in Cabo and upgrade to a larger condo foreign for foreign. So U.S. for U.S., foreign for foreign. So that doesn't apply to everybody, but there are some interesting planning opportunities. And um, I've been involved in lots of those all over the world. To be honest, it's fascinating to see how property transfers happen in all these other countries. So definitely a possibility. So Scott, for most folks, right, they have a property they want to sell. It's appreciated. It's got good cash flow, but they got their eye on a property that uh, might continue that path with even greater cash flow and greater appreciation. And that's a great tool here. And it would make sense that, well, I have to sell my property to buy another one. But there is also the concept of a reverse exchange, not to get too into the weeds, but just explain how that tool might work, because I think we might have folks listening who could avail themselves of a reverse exchange. Yeah. A reverse exchange is kind of what it sounds like. You're going to purchase the new property, what we call the replacement property, before you sell the one you currently own. So you've got the same 180-day time window. You purchase first. And when I say you, you're going to engage a qualified intermediary. These are called, the technical term is a parking arrangement. And so the reverse is a fantastic tool, Robert. If you've got an off-market deal, or maybe you've got a purchase that you know there's built-in equity, but it's a hot market and they're turning over quickly. And the seller says, look, I need you to buy it right now and close in a month. I can't wait till you sell your property. A reverse allows you to do that. And here's the beauty of a reverse. When you do a normal exchange, you sell and you don't know what you're going to buy. In a reverse exchange, you're buying first and then selling. So it almost takes a lot of the mystery out. I've personally done a reverse exchange years ago um, where I had a great buying opportunity, was able to purchase an asset that other people were interested in because I was able to scoop it up quickly through a reverse. I exchanged out of another property and then To make things a little more complex, I did a forward delayed exchange into a second replacement property. So a reverse followed by a delayed exchange, just showing that there's a lot of options. There are things called improvement exchanges or builds a suit. So I can improve and renovate an asset during the 180 days. I can build something from the ground up. And Robert, I can even combine a reverse exchange with an improvement right? So I buy the land and I start building my new property. And we see a lot of people that are maybe an owner user that wants to do that for their business. What if you want to build your dream vacation rental cabin on a lake? $2 million property you want to build to your specs. A reverse improvement allows you to build exactly what you want rather than having to buy what's out on the marketplace. So there are some creative things. These are considerably more complex and, and a lot more moving parts. But again, It just goes to show you the exchange can really help you accomplish a lot of goals if you're talking to your tax advisor and a qualified intermediary and seeing you got all these options available. See, we told you it was exciting stuff. Hey, Scott, we really appreciate uh, you bringing your wealth of knowledge. We could go on for two more hours about this stuff, but Scott's put together this cool report. All you have to do to get your copy, it's called 10 Reasons to Exchange and Why You Should Never Pay Capital Gains Tax Again. Just send an email to exchange at realestateguysradio.com, exchange at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get that report. Plus, you'll get the vacation home handbook and you'll get Scott's contact details. You want to pick his brain on one of these complex, complicated, awesome exchanges. Uh, Good stuff today, Scott. We sure appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks for being on the program. Great being with you. Thanks so much. Had a blast. There's Scott Saunders. He's the Senior Vice President with Asset Preservation Incorporated. Just make sure you get his report. Send an email to exchange at realestateguysradio.com. 
You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys Radio Show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. As I speak, inflation is robbing you at a rate north of 10%. Last year, the number one zip code that Mid-South Homebuyers offered income property to Real Estate Guys listeners in appreciated by 21%. To harness that spread and protect and grow your wealth in the current economic storm, you need the two decades of experience in renovation and management that Mid-South Homebuyers brings to their investors. Every home Mid-South offers you will have brand new components, a new 30-year roof, and a high-quality renter, all in a price range under $150,000. Their empathetic property managers will use your ROI as their North Star, while the lack of repairs on their totally renovated properties contributes to their almost four-year average renter's stay and 99% occupancy rate. Learn about their lifetime occupancy guarantee and total one-year maintenance guarantee by emailing midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's MidSouth at realestateguysradio.com. You'll be glad you did. Hi, I'm Garrett Sutton. And I'm Ted Sutton. And we're the father and son legal team at Corporate Direct. Are your assets protected? We live in a litigious society. One lawsuit and you could lose everything. You need the professional and affordable asset protection from Corporate Direct. And now on top of protecting your assets, the government has a new disclosure requirement called the Corporate Transparency Act, or CTA. If you don't file the CTA form on time, the penalties are $10,000 and two years in jail. At Corporate Direct, we can help you get through this new government maze. We offer a free 15-minute consultation with an incorporating specialist on forming a corporation or LLC. And we can help with your CTA filings. Remember, the penalties for not filing are steep. We're here at Corporate Direct to help. To learn more and get connected to Garrett and Ted, send an email to at at realestateguysradio.com. That's at at realestateguysradio.com. Are you ready to ride the wave of success in the booming car wash industry? Tommy's Express Car Wash is the cutting edge brand that's revolutionizing the way we clean vehicles. Demand for top notch, state of the art tunnel car washes is skyrocketing. Institutions are diving in head first and we're already a step ahead. We have a world-class operations team and we are building a portfolio of Tommy's Express car washes that's on track to become one of the largest privately owned car wash portfolios in the US. The margins on a stabilized Tommy's Express car wash are incredible and accredited investors have the chance to join us on this venture. I'm Dave Zook, founder and CEO of The Real Asset Investor and my team and I are thrilled to share this opportunity with you. Let's boost your cash flow, unlock massive tax benefits, and get you set up for a lucrative exit just a few years from now. To get a copy of your free report, send an email to carwash at realestateguysradio.com. Hi there, this is Danielle DiMartino Booth, author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Hey, if you want to see an awesome real estate market up close and personal and spend time with yours truly, then come on out to the Jacksonville Field Trip. Jacksonville, Florida is an amazing market. We're actually going to look at a wider area than just Jacksonville, but it's a great time, great group of folks. This will be our third trip to Jacksonville. Come see what all the excitement is about. One of the greatest things about Jacksonville, other than great tenant landlord law and pretty good affordability, is the fact that there is good inventory there and lower interest rates than you might expect. Get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Under events, you can navigate to the live and in-person events where you'll find the Jacksonville Field Trip. Happens in mid-September. Hope to see you there. Well, my goodness, a ton today on 1031 Tax Divert Exchanges. Boy, Scott Saunders is just a wealth of knowledge. I've had the chance to sit with him talking to folks about specific situations, and he is an encyclopedia of this stuff because he's been doing it for so long. Now, 1031 Exchanges aren't for everybody, but for most transactions, they are worth considering. Now, of course, Scott shared with you the timelines that you have to adhere to, and that first 45 days is critical. 
the joke in the real estate brokerage community is why is it every time someone is in the middle of their identification period, they go on vacation? It just seems that way. It's, oh, yeah, I've got to identify my three properties, but I'm going to be gone for two weeks. Not sure why that is. But one of the nuances we didn't talk about is when you do identify, say you're using the three property rule, I'm selling a single property and I want to buy a single property, a little more in value, a little more in mortgage perhaps. I don't have to be in contract to buy that up leg property. I could be, and there's reasons you'd want to be. But then you've got the whole issue of closing on time and will the seller extend? And if you haven't sold your property yet, all the things that are happening, the best time to be thinking about your up leg property is before you actually sell the relinquished property or down leg property. But we've been involved in many 1031 exchanges, both as principals and back when I was in the real estate brokerage business, I was never a licensed broker. I was a licensed salesperson for 18 years. My dad was a broker. And I remember we had a listing on a house. It was a nice house in a good residential neighborhood, but there were some rentals in the area. And we had another real estate agent in our marketplace reach out and said, hey, I've got a guy in a 1031. He's got his eye on a property, but I want to make sure he's protected. So we want to identify an extra property or two. And we wanted to consider your property as one of our three. Would your seller be open to cooperating with uh, 1031 and so on? Well, of course, we said, yeah, sure. No, no reason not to. That could be a sale, even if it was just a backup in their mind. Well, lo and behold, what happened is the first property that they had their eyes on sold out from under them, and so did the second property. So now they're in the middle of an exchange. They have identified three properties, including our client's property we have the listing on, and the other two have sold. So what just happened to the three property rule? Well, they just had one property left, which was our property. So think about what that did to their negotiating position. (laughs) They couldn't come in and lowball my seller because my seller knew that, hey, this is the only property that will allow you to complete your exchange and defer the tax. We did sell that property to those folks and they paid a nice price. Which a couple lessons in there. One, if you're a real estate agent or broker, you might not think that someone identifying property number three out of three is going to be a high likelihood. And it's not. But if it happens, you look like a hero to your client. But the other lesson is you have to choose wisely. I know of a situation, and I'm sure Scott's seen this more than I have, where all three properties sell. And now you don't have an exchange. So you really do want to understand the rules the timelines, and what's happening actively in your market. If the market is hot and property is selling quickly, much better idea to already be under contract and perhaps negotiate some extensions ahead of time to close to accommodate your 1031. You get lots more ideas in Scott's report, the 10 reasons to exchange and why you should never pay capital gains tax again. You get a copy of that, plus his vacation home handbook, by sending an email to exchange at realestateguysradio.com, exchange at realestateguysradio.com. Scott's also going to include that language he talked about that's important to have in your listing agreements and sales agreements to paint the right picture for tax purposes. Hey, before we get out of here, it's time for this week's Market Spotlight. Almost every week on Market Spotlight, we talk about an awesome real estate market. Today, we're going to talk about not a geographic market, but a demographic market to help us do that. Let's welcome our good friend, Isabel Garino. Hey, Isabel. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always great to spend time with you. You are an infectious woman that loves to spread the good word about this demographic you guys serve. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, we focus on residential assisted living. And when we're looking at getting into that that real estate market, the number one thing we're always looking for is the right demographic market, which the timing has never been better, right? We have the baby boomers starting to just now approach that assisted living age. And this is a huge opportunity for people to get involved in 
all that real estate that's going to be coming to the market really soon. And it's not uh, any one specific geographic area. There are residential assisted living facilities kind of everywhere because of the nature of it. But the demand curve is what is amazing. You know, the start of the baby boomers, they're going to keep coming for a long, long time. And then the next demographic after that. So what you guys do is a little different than what we might perceive as kind of that institutional, you know, three-story, 100-unit kind of building. Uh, talk about the distinction. Yeah, what we focus on is residential assisted living. So single-family homes. Now, when I say single-family, I don't mean a three-two, right? I mean right. a luxury, upscale, nice home in a really nice part of town, but they are still zoned residential, and they're housing somewhere between six and 16 residents in the home. So not 100 people, like you said, in a three-story building, right, with all these caregivers coming and going. Instead, it's a residential setting to serve those seniors and give them that quality care in their last years of life. Well, the neat thing is most of them spent most of their life in a home like that, so they are feeling more at home when they're with a smaller group of folks than, you know, the hallways of a giant apartment building or, or almost hospital sometimes. So it's great for that uh, result. Uh, but also the fact that you do have a business overlay. So the business of making sure you take care of these seniors is maybe even different from the real estate part of the equation. Can you explain that? Absolutely. You know, in a big box facility, the ratio is typically 30 seniors to one caregiver. So that's impossible, right? One person can not take care of 30 people. And especially these are high need, you know, individuals towards the end of life. They typically need help with three to five activities of daily living or ADLs, as we call it in the industry, by the time you move into assisted living. So this is not like everyone's good on their own. These are high need individuals. In our smaller care home settings, it's a four to one or five to one ratio, which is a lot more acceptable. So the quality of care increases, you know, the food is good, the home smells good, everyone's getting the love and attention and quality care that they really deserve towards the end of life, which is so important. Not only is the environment more comfortable, like we talked about, but the care is just so much greater because our caregivers have the ability to actually be there and serve the seniors when they need that. Now, from a real estate investment perspective, one of the most attractive things is not just that you're doing a cool thing for folks that need the help, but also there's better cash flow from these types of homes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's that do good, do well model. You know, most of these homes are homes and our students' homes are cash flowing easily 10K a month on just one property. And we really encourage that you scale it. You have two to four homes within 20 to 40 minutes of each other. So that way you can really have kind of your hold on your market because you want options for the seniors. If someone needs something in a different part of town or a little less expensive, you want to have that flexibility. So having that, you know, two to four homes nearby each other is a really great way to go. But 10K a month, even on one home, that's tough to make with make do with single family investing these days. So it really is one of the more lucrative opportunities. And you feel good about what you're doing, which is that benefit on top. Now, I've had a chance to see several of these homes and meet dozens and dozens of your students. And this is something that is easy to do, but it does take a little more training than just owning rental homes. So thankfully, you guys do a three-day training several times a year. Talk about that, because that trip is really unique. Yeah, we host a three-day training here in Phoenix, Arizona, about eight times per year, every six to eight weeks or so. And in that training, we're really going through every single thing step by step, because the real estate can be seen as kind of the easy part of this, right? Buying and retrofitting and getting it ready to go for the seniors. But what about the licensing? What about the hiring and all the policies and procedures within the home and raising capital? That's why we love to work with you guys and, you know, all of the different events you host with um, the Secrets of Successful Syndication because you really help our students raise the capital for this entire project because it's not a light, a light lift, right? It's a heavy load and you want to make sure you're doing it right. So there's so many things along the way. And so we like to show everyone A to Z how to do this, how to find the home home, fund the home, and fill the home. And that's a really beautiful way to go about that. So in those trainings, we can go through that step by step. 
It's so good. And uh, if you'd like more information about one of those trainings, whether you're thinking about this as a passive investment, which some people do, or, hey, I'd like to own the real estate and find an operator to run it, or you know what? This sounds like something I'd like to take on as a business endeavor. You want to come out to uh, the three-day course with uh, the Residential Assisted Living Academy. We'll tell you how to do that right after this. Hey, Isabel, thanks for sharing with us today. Thanks so much for having me. There is the effervescent Isabel Garino. Hey, if you'd like to know more about what Isabel does at Residential Assisted Living Academy, all you have to do is send an email to ALF, A-L-F, that is Assisted Living Facility, ALF, at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get a link to an awesome video series she's put together where she explains a lot of the details. Just send an email to ALF, A-L-F, at realestateguysradio.com. A big thanks to Isabel for popping in for Market Spotlight. Next week, Market Spotlight will be on another geographic market, but from time to time, we like to focus on a demographic market. And of course, big thanks to Scott Saunders. Hopefully today's opened up your mind as far as planning your real estate portfolio in a way that makes you money and saves you on taxes. It is last call for the 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Just a couple cabins left. We'd love to have you join us. It's June 13th to the 23rd. We'll start in Fort Lauderdale at a beautiful hotel for a couple of days. Then take a voyage on a brand new beautiful luxury cruise ship with Peter Schiff, Tommy Hopkins, George Gammon, Ken McElroy, and CPA Tom Wheelwright, plus a bunch more. Come with us. Get all the details at investorssummitatsea.com. Got a great show for you next week, talking about one of my favorite asset classes. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.